Welcome back to Global Connections on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Jay Fidel. Today, we're going to talk about game, set, and match for labor. Our guest for the show is Rupmati Kandakar. She is a political geopolitical analyst. And we're going to talk about what happened in Britain, the elections where Starmer won, and we now have a labor government after 14 years of a conservative government. And that could change everything. So many things could change right now. Welcome to the show, Rupmati. Aloha, Jay, and thank you for me having me on your show. I'm delighted to be here. Why don't you tell us what happened here and um, what, what the mechanisms were by which Keir Starmer actually won? Jay, it was like a Wimbledon headline, didn't it? Read uh, like Keir Starmer defeats Rishi Sonak. So Britain's centre-left Labour Party swept away the long-standing Conservatives in a landslide victory. Now, all this is, you know, uh, jingoism, uh, if you don't understand the, the words Labour, Conservative, you know, for any person who's just coming into Tories, this is, these are terms which would, uh, which would uh, keep the person guessing what happened. But Rishi Sona uh, is a Tory, He's a, he's a, he was the prime minister and he was voted out uh, by Keir Stammer, uh, and which was the uh, Labour Party. So Labour comes into power after 14 long years. And factors that, you know, you think bring uh, the long-standing party out of power, uh, first and foremost, anti-incumbency factor. And <laughs> it was like 14 long years um, uh, Labour was in uh, uh, out of power, and uh, to see uh, Keir Starmer deliver such a landslide victory, Jay, was shocking because this was one of the lowest voter turnouts in two decades. Uh, so that is one point to be noted that uh, we didn't have that much of a, a vibrant election, isn't it? And uh, Jay, uh, Britain is dealing with the worst cost of living since uh, World War Two. So that's the state of economy that UK is in right now. Rishi Sunak apologized after the election. What was he apologizing for? Was he responsible to bring in the vote and fail to do that? I might add, by the way, that the vote was only 60% of eligible voters. So this was not a big turnout. Um, and you wonder whether it's a real win or perhaps uh, just a superficial short-term win and the Conservatives will come back. Can you talk about those things? Yeah, Jay. So the British Parliament has about 650 seats and the uh, majority mark was 326 halfway through. But uh, the Conservative Tory managed only 121. So it was a, a huge bring down in the number of seats, though the water share has not decreased that much. So Rishi Shana coming and apologizing is uh, his moral responsibility as leader of uh, the team. But he has kept, uh, in his defense, he has kept his seat, which was uh, uh, traditionally, they were saying that Labour, would, he would lose on it. But he kept his seat in the parliament and four other uh, ruling prime ministers. Liz Truss, if you remember, she was uh, the shortest serving prime minister of Britain for 44 days. She lost her seat. And then you, she had become the first prime minister to lose their seat in about 100 years. We are reeling in that. And then David Cameron goes and loses his. his. Uh, Boris uh, loses his. And uh, Theresa May loses her seat. So Rishi Sonak is kind of the only uh, prime minister who has managed to keep his, hold on to his seat. So he, is, uh, he, he kept himself in the reckoning. Uh, but <laughs> when, uh, Jay, it is... Uh, well, it is diff it is really um, like tennis. You didn't know where it was heading. Four prime ministers down, conservatives coming uh, down so heavily. Jeremy yeah. Corbyn's back. Uh, he was <laughs> Labour for many years, and um, yeah. uh, interestingly enough, that uh, he he didn't run as Labour. He ran against Labour and won mm -hmm. as an independent. What what does that mean? What what is going on there with Jeremy Corbyn? Oh, he's still mumbling, isn't it? He still mumbles and uh, cribs 
I think just a few hours back, while taking the oath of allegiance to the monarch, uh, King Charles, he was mumbling and he was saying, do we need to really do this? So he is still the same, whether independent labor of uh, uh, Tory, he is still the same, Jay. Uh, let's hope <laughs> he doesn't cause any more mischief over there. <laughs> that way. Grant was the former defense minister. When he has lost and he is giving his speech, he talks about how the infighting in conservatives uh, led to this kind, this loss. And he says that if what we had uh, within the house, the infighting in the house was kept in the house itself, and more not these squabbles were not brought out in the public, they would have had a better performance. It was all out in uh, on display for the British public to see. And really, when uh, you are a citizen of any country, you like to see stability in the government. If you see bickering and if you see infighting, you prefer not to have them. Now, Keir Stammer was not such a prominent figure, but people have indeed voted against the Conservative Party rather than voted for the Labour Party, if you know what I mean. It is uh, against the Conservatives. They didn't want the Conservatives. Alternative was what? Labour. So Labour has got this victory, Jay. And landslide victory, Jay. 461, 412. 412 out of 650. What is Starmer doing now? He, he sort of got off to a racing start. What kind of a cabinet has he appointed? What kind of positions has he expressed? Jay, he is now, right now, one of the most powerful prime ministers that Britain has seen in a long, long time, majorly because of this landslide victory. But he has to deal with the skeletons in the closet kept by the Labour Party, and he's got so many of them to deal with. He, he, is, he has been handed down an uh, economy which is in shambles, like I said uh, earlier, that it is uh, one of the worst cost of living than, like, since the World War, uh, Second World War, um, the immigration factor is high and up up there, right? And uh, you have, um, what do you say, uh, the health system, which uh, NHS, which is so acclaimed right now, people are frustrated with having even appointments, Jay. So that is the kind of uh, condition of the health syst healthcare system that UK has. And we know that it's frustrating if during your healthcare, you don't get even get an appointment. So those basic daily routine frustrations that have set in are what he has to bring uh, into order first initially. And when he came up with his opening speech, he said, I've come to make the change. So let's see now how, how it happens. Part of this uh, landslide is uh, people want change. And they voted yeah. for Weir Stammer because he represented and promised change. So, you know, he's, he's really got to work to do that now. He will lose that popularity that he started out with pretty quickly if he doesn't, um, you know, move forward on these initiatives. So what about, um, you know, what about his relations with the U.S., with Israel, with the Palestinians who are actually in the streets right now uh, protesting, um, and on the EU, and on Brexit, and on NATO? I think he said something about increasing military spending to over 2%, which is the NATO expectation, uh, and Ukraine. These are, these are the big what do you want to call it, international items on his desk. Um, what is his position on those things? Yeah, Jay, like you said, uh, Labour Party was the one that brought about Brexit. And uh, uh, like we know, uh, immigration, it was brought into curb immigration. That has not stopped. Um, he is, uh, it, it was brought in to bring uh, to hold on to uh, British prosperity. That has not stopped. So uh, Brexit, for him, he has to maneuver his way and find a way which is semi uh, trying to get back to the EU and trying to mend the ways with EU, either with individual countries, with uh, bilateral, uh, you know, uh, relations that way. So uh, either he cannot literally go back into the EU, that is technically not possible immediate with immediate effect, but now he will have to strengthen his ties with uh, individual, with European Union as a whole. That will be like a midway path that he will have to work out. And uh, Jay, one of his plans for jumpstarting the economy is exactly that, to uh, bring about trade, uh, increase in trade. 
and for that he uh, wants uh, to increase um, not only trade with EU but also look towards India and he wants a free trade agreement with India. He wants to bring in America, uh, have closer trade relations with um, America. So trade is his forte right now. He is looking like the ancient East India Company. You know, Britain's began its prosperity <laughs> with the East India Company. So he is trying to go that path and start from the seas day. What this represents is a, is a move from the conservative on the right to the liberal on the left. And, um, oh. you know, it means not only is where Stammer um, left, but it re reflects the fact that the, the people of, of the UK are moving left. Maybe they've already moved left to a significant degree. At the same time, we have so many countries uh, in, in the EU that have moved right. I mean, it's just, Hungary is just one example uh, with Viktor Orban, but there are others too uh, moving right. And we've had issues in France, although it seems to be going back and forth in France. I mean, France is kind of confused in its own way. One day it's right, one day it's left. Um, but you know, is, is Europe moving to the right or is it moving to the left or is it confused about which way it's going or is it, you know, is it something that hasn't really finished yet? And what does what happened in this election in Britain, uh, what does that tell us? Yeah, Jay, the left right movement is really, really confusing right now in Europe because every country has got its own uh, preferences, but um, it has to be really noted that this is just the beginning. There is immigration, which is now now just going to peak. It is not even peaked. And that is the time when people are frustrated. People are not understanding uh, to open uh, the borders or to close the borders or to, um, uh, to favor the uh, openness of our, our society or prefer to conserve, be conservative in our society. And that is the way, uh, that is where our confusion is lying. And if you see country by country, Netherlands has gone far right. Uh, France coalition, um, Britain has gone to left. These things, Jay, all these things are going to change as demographics of Europe will change. And demographics are definitely, surely on the, uh, um, uh, changing path because you remember you had said that uh, the immigrants which come in they bring in increased demography of their kind and when increased demography of their kind it will reduce your indigenous population when an indigenous population falls down automatically they come into the political system and when they come into the political system jay uh, they will dominate Today, Britain's parliament is one of the most diverse. You have around 26 MPs from India, 26 MPs from Africa. This is the kind of, uh, it was the most number of uh, ethnic uh, um, outside British uh, people that were fielded in this election. What does that say? Britain has uh, completely uh, become multicultural. No, rather it has become non-British that way. My impression is that a lot of migrants have come over from continental Europe into Britain and some of them have been, you know, processed and some of them have not. But there are a lot of people from the Middle East, North Africa um, that have come over in the past few years since all this mi migrant phenomenon has started. And they have um, they have been interwoven, as you say, into the into the society in, in Britain. And they're in government, they're everywhere. And they're on the streets um, protesting too. Uh, and yeah. they promise to be more uh, prolific and more involved in government going forward. And this will mm -hmm. change things. So are, are the immigrants part of labor? Is that what happened here? Uh, they, they have come, they have, um, you know, increased their numbers um, and they are part of labor and, and they voted for uh, Stammer and the Labor, Labor Party. Is that what happened? 
Jay, uh, Rishi Sunak came up with a plan known as the Rwanda plan, which we discussed before, that he wanted to send the immigrants directly to Rwanda. So yeah. that was the kind of stance that they were trying to take to have a very hardliner policy against immigrants. Now, to say that we uh, labor is being voted for uh, their pro-immigration policies is going to be uh, almost right, Jay, because... Uh, uh, they don't, they're going to do away with, they have already openly said they're doing away with the Rwanda plan. Nothing of that sort will take place. They will have a border control command, new thing which will take place. Uh, but can you control the borders? Can you control border of Dover at least? Uh, the, the coastline is so big, people are coming with dinghies from Spain, from anywhere in the world. So uh, having a command like that is going to be of uh, little or no use. And uh, just those people coming in jail, obtaining their cards to vote, uh, their friends and acquaintances uh, wanting them to vote, Britain wanting a more and more open society. Why? Because the immigration population has taken root in British society. They have become now citizens of British society. They prefer more immigration. And the conservatives who wanted less immigration are out of power. So they are outnumbered, outpowered, and uh, we step into a world where there is going to be a less British ethnic society. British ethnic might just become a minority very soon. Five years is the time. Yeah, it's, it's easy to predict that. Just look at, the, as you said, it's uh, look at the demographics. That's what you get, it's very clear. Yes. And so uh, how, how does that change things? Does that mean that labor, if, if the migrants, the immigrants are in, the labor camp, so to speak, um, that labor is going to be in for the long term. This was not a one shot turning. Um, this was a turning that that speaks to the future. And it also speaks to the Conservative Party. They better change their ways if they want to appeal um, to all these voters. Yeah, Jay. Uh, definitely. Conservatives uh, um, right now out of the picture because of the, the sheer size of the victory that uh, uh, Labour has got. Uh, otherwise, if they had a close call, they could have done a coalition, they could have come back, you know, you have a chance of the government falling. Uh, but Conservatives uh, themselves are so divided right now. It's such a divided house. They need to have a strong leader who can, they can believe in, you know. They have to have 100% backing of Rishi Sona if they want him as the leader. Or, you know, Boris has lost. Uh, if you want Boris to come back, uh, support him. But don't be in those camps which will be not here, not there. And uh, let's, um, it can't be a playground thing. It's its mainland politics. And unless you have a united front, you can't promise a stable government to the people. And Labour has been, uh, Jay, not so known. They were not in the public eye. Their display was not in the public eye. So we kind of now think... Um, Hammer is very stable. We don't know the politics behind it, but these people, the Tories have been playing it out in the public. So we know there is a lot of infighting. They don't support their leader. There is a lot. Liz Truss, 44 days in parliament uh, as prime minister. So we need stability. Stability. I just wonder what's going to happen here with uh, Labour. Um, you know, it speaks of diversity, it speaks of migrants and immigrants, it speaks of, you know, the new Britain, so to speak. Um, and those people who are protesting for the Palestinians and who actually right after October 7th in London, they were protesting for Hamas. Um, is that going to affect, um, you know, the leadership of Weir Stammer? Because Stammer said, uh, one of his early statements was that he was going to continue to support Israel. Can he do that politically? Yeah, Jay, it is British policy to support Israel. And uh, I think that support will continue irrespective of who sits in the chair. Uh, and they will, uh, they will definitely, Israel has got these friends who will always be by their side, uh, come what may. And that is what uh, uh, works in, in international diplomacy because, uh, but, it will hurt him nationally, domestically, because Jay, uh, like you said, the Palestine protests are on. They get support from unknown corners. They get funding from unknown sources and uh, they keep on being pricking points for the government. And 
these uh, uh, J, these elements are such that they are they are um, created for create uh, for creating a disorder in the political system. Mm -hmm. They want them to create chaos. You see the rallies, you see the uh, protests. They will litter the streets. They will uh, throw down the buildings. They will uh, smash. Uh, uh, stuff in uh, politicians' faces. This is the kind of destructive, disruptive activities that they indulge in. There's no constructive protest. The other thing that I noticed that uh, Summer said was that he, he wanted to stay close to the U.S., of course. I mean, we go back. I'm thinking that um, Trump creates a problem because uh, Trump's foreign policy is uh, ad hoc. Uh, it's uh, kind of chaotic. Um, and I don't know how Weir Stammer will be able to handle that. Uh, your thoughts about what happens if Trump gets back into office in the United States? How, how will that affect relations with Britain? I think one of the first congratulatory calls was to the U.S., uh, from the U.S. Uh, to Stammer. And uh, Jay, he promised to work closely to build a U.S.-Britain uh, uh, partnership and that's the regular kind of uh, uh, political stuff that he spoke about. Uh, now, if Trump comes into power, you be um, we know that he will uh, obviously continue uh, having good relations with Stammer, but he also will Trump also eyes Russia as a semi-ally. He doesn't view him as an antagonistic. Uh, political colleague, he views him as a semi-ally, I can uh, say that. Uh, so Trump's equations with Britain and Europe uh, change because of Russia. His stance on Russia, his stance on NATO. So he is kind of uh, um, uh, unstable in his policies. It is how he wakes up and what he decides to do. He doesn't have any set uh, uh, rules. It is how he would he would decide today. I'm feeling like doing this, and he will go for that. He's like one of those monarchs who just feel he can do anything. He is not a voted uh, person. Oh, he has said as much. <laughs> so you know, this is going to present a real challenge if that happens yeah. to Weir Stammer. He's going to have to deal with the unpredictable U.S. policy and president. You know, I've I've harbored the thought that uh, Brexit was a mistake for Britain, um, and it was a political mistake. And and maybe uh, there was social media coming into the electorate in Britain from outside, like from Putin, um, encouraging Brexit to divide and conquer. Do you think there's any chance under Weir Stammer um, that Brexit could be reversed, um, that Britain could um, you know have uh, significant new relationships with the EU? Yeah, Jay, you're right about Brexit being a mistake. It was a mistake and that uh, uh, Labour was um, under the view that Europe was benefiting more from Britain than Britain benefiting from Europe. So that was the crux of the whole uh, idea of the Brexit uh, thing. But uh, Jay, if we see, Britain has gone on a downslide after that. So uh, bringing it back, technically, I don't think uh, EU would be like a door just opening and closing, coming back. But he will have <laughs> to strengthen. <laughs> he will have to strengthen ties with each and every of them, or as EU as a whole, or something. You know, he'll have to go back to a semi-agreement like this to uh, come as close to uh, the pre-Brexit uh, situation as possible. Jay. Well, Brexit, I think Brexit led to a decline in the British economy. I, I don't know if the economists Definitely. would agree that that was the only factor. It was probably a lot of factors. But uh, and now we have uh, Weir Stammer uh, saying that he is going to increase military spending for, um, for Britain and, and in, uh, contributions to NATO. And that, that sounds like uh, he has the money. And of course, it is the statement of support for Ukraine. But does he have the money? There are issues about uh, the economy, about uh, about government debt, um, about the national health care system in Britain, all speaking of the fact that Britain's economy is not so good. It doesn't have the money. And here he is increasing military spending uh, substantially for NATO, for Ukraine. 
um, and for the you know the industrial complex of Britain. Is that is that going to work or is that pie in the sky? Jay uh, Stammer has uh, made it clear that he is going for the taxes and taxes not for the poor, but he is targeting those uh, urban rich like Rishi Sonak's wife who has evaded like millions in the, due to the loopholes in the tax system or you know every every rich person is making a, a hideout right now because Stammer says he's coming after those loopholes and he's going to make sure that the rich get taxed for their money and he uh, generates money from this source more than any other source. So he's made it very clear he wants to go for taxation but taxation not of the general public of the rich holding money. So that's his way. Mm -hmm. Well, it's very interesting. You know, it's, it's an echo of what uh, Joe Biden has been saying. They're, they're birds of a feather in many ways. And, uh, you know, I, I think that the, um, the, the Democrats, the liberals, the progressives in, in this country would support Stammer's position. Um, but I wonder what, what would happen when, uh, as and when Trump gets back into office, that would, that would change. And maybe that would change some of where Stammer's policies your thoughts about where we're going here with Britain, your thoughts about where this will take us. You know, it's, it's the blush. It's the, uh, the honeymoon, so to speak, and the press, uh, which is very, you know, vociferous in the UK. The press will support him at least for a while. But where is it going to go? Is he going to be able to maintain his popularity uh, or will things happen that will um, undermine his popularity? I know that's a hard question, but why don't you Try to give me an answer on that. Jay, right now we are relying on his personal charisma because if you go to see visually, uh, he looks like a more stable British, British uh, prime minister rather than Rishi Sonak who comes from an immigrant family and who doesn't have that. There is a stability that he exudes. And that I think is attracted uh, the British voter him itself uh, to vote for a stable British prime minister. And uh, uh, to have a um, liberal outlook for immigration. But you see, the British are always those stiff upper lip. You don't know what's going on. At the same time, when they were voting the Labour power into power, they have bought in Nigel Farage, uh, Farage's uh, Reform Party, Jay. They have managed to get 14% of the votes. It is a, it is a nationalist and anti-immigration party, Jay. And uh, uh, Nigel Farage himself, he attempted to get into British Parliament eight times, and this is the first time he has succeeded. So uh, <laughs> there's a voice in the British public which which will keep on niggling uh, uh, Stammer for a long, long time, Jay. He will never have 100% of the votes, and conservatives will uh, keep on trying to get that power which they were so used to for 14 years. Uh, he comes across now as, uh, a, a, um, what do you say? as hope in a British society for people uh, and he, how, he, how he wants to deliver on it because he has got a lame economy, absolutely lame economy to generate something and then to, uh, I told you like the East India Company start from scratch. Um, he's got a long task ahead of him and it's going to be interesting to see his dynamics with the world leaders because each of the countries, the major world players, have got uh, leaders who are 25 years uh, into power, you know, almost 20, 20 years into two decades into power, and he is new. So how he is going to deal with these veterans of uh, politics is going to be such an uh, uh, interesting thing to watch. Jay. The French election moved right, but then there was a reaction to the move to the right, and then the left be became you know, more powerful in the legislature. Um, and now people are saying Fran France is ungovernable because they got two contending uh, factions in the legislature, left and right. And, and I wonder how that compares. I wonder what Britain learns from France or France learns from Britain or the US learns to see these, uh, you know, left groups, labor party groups, if you will, uh, emerging. Um, maybe this is something where they will affect other countries, uh, including the United States, where people will see it's not all it's not all going right, and the liberals can win, 
um, and I think we'll all be watching Britain very closely. France will be watching Britain. The US should be watching Britain. Um, and you and I will be watching Britain. I would like to make you um, the Secretary of State of the United States. Uh, I'd like you to be in that office as long as possible, by the way. Um, and I would like to ask you what your policy would be and how you would watch and adapt to what is going to happen, <clears throat> how you would watch and adapt what is going to happen uh, in Britain now with this new leadership. What would you do? What would you change um, to, um, to bond up closer than in the past? What would you do to encourage what we consider uh, a democratic um, direction, a liberal direction in Britain, a new time in Britain? What would you as the Secretary of State uh, want to do? How would you change your foreign relations policy? Today, to, <laughs> to have that uh, uh, relationship with Britain, to um, uh, personally, I would go far, 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 far right. <laughs> because, <laughs> because, Jay, uh, being left means uh, attracting uh, um, chaos, Jay. And uh, right now, we need is order, Jay. The international system right now is in such a mess because of this uh, immigration and liberal policies, we need what is known as neoliberalism that is equal to back to conservatism. So uh, that, is, that is what is required in the international economy. If you want globalization to succeed, that is the uh, uh, formula which was used that you stay in your borders and you mingle. If you, if you, if you move and break your borders, there is going to be chaos and there's going to be implosion of the borders. And that is what is going to happen in the US if they, you know, taking away our jobs, taking away, um, uh, increasing the uh, uh, recession, inflation. These are factors which will um, not only reflect in water uh, turnout, but also in our daily lives. So you need to have um, a mindset which is conservative but an outlook that is liberal, <laughs> if, if that makes any sense. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, you know, I guess the, the, the underlying point is that we have to watch what goes on, not only in Britain, but in France and the rest of the <laughs> EU, and see how these changes are doing. And we have to learn how to cope with them and make our moves, um, you know, to, to s sort of um, relate to them and, and have a robust... Uh, diplomatic relations, because if we don't do that, uh, then Mr. Putin will move in as he is trying every day. And uh, for yes. that matter, uh, Xi Jinping will move in and uh, and Narendra Modi will move in um, <laughs> and, and have, have greater effect than before. Um, so the United States, if it wants to retain, you know, its status as the city on the hill, it has to be involved in these things. It has to follow these things and it has yes. to adopt adopt policies uh, that will mm, bring it closer, don't you think? Absolutely right. Absolutely. As the hegemon of the system, to maintain that position is such a uh, possibility, Jay, and to uh, not only monitor, but also uh, maintain your supremacy is what is the U.S. has to undertake on a daily basis. And uh, you have one of the biggest markets, you have one of the biggest manufacturers, you have biggest oil suppliers. They are, they are forming the troika of uh, international relations. And to deal with three of them alone, because the other players, Jay, are not as formidable uh, as what these three people are projecting themselves to be. India, China are antagonistic to each other, but Russia is playing the glue. So uh, that is what is... Uh, they're having an ecosystem of their own uh, dealing with each other. So the U.S. has to have an alternative, also, uh, what do you say, uh, equally viable option, Jay. And that is where it keeps India in the loophole. So uh, that it can't maintain. You, we, we know China is never a reliable friend nor a reliable enemy. Uh, you remember that line we had discussed that in Chinese warfare, they're saying is that you never let the person in front know what is going to be your next move. So loyalty is not their forte. 
Uh, so the U.S. has to uh, maintain relations with countries who have a record of sorts, a record of loyalty, and uh, free trade agreements with countries who suck out uh, your energy and your economy is not viable. You have to have somebody who has a mutual symbiotic relationship, Jay. And that is where Britain comes up, India comes up. So U.S. has to maintain uh, and uh, make these relationships, bilateral relationships, prosper. Uh, with the EU as a whole, yes, but the EU takes in the security from the US uh, via NATO. So, uh, um, uh, relationship. You have to have something which has a give and take. And uh, Jay, for the next 25 years, at least the hegemony is protected. Uh, and uh, a stronger leader will only make uh, things better for the US. That is that is always in the loop in the next line, Jay. Okay, we're out of time. Rupmati Khandrakar, <laughs> our global geopolitical strategist, thank you so much for this discussion. We'll have to follow it going forward because it's a moving target. Thank you for having me, Jay. It's always, always, always my pleasure. Aloha. Thank you. Aloha, Jay.